Take five seconds to pause the video, read the question, and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, kind of a shorter question, but this is a really good one because of the options here. So let's just go through this really quick. So we have a 46-year-old male, past medical history of cocaine and alcohol use, coming to the emergency room for palpitations. And the patient went out on a binge prior to arrival, and the last drink was reported to have been five minutes prior to walking in the emergency department. EKG strip is shown below. Which of the following is most likely directly related to the heart rate observed in the patient? So it's kind of hard to tell exactly what the heart rate here is because we have an irregular rhythm. The first thing that should stand out to you here is, look, you have irregular RR intervals and you kind of have an erratic baseline. In general, when you see irregularly irregular rhythms, especially for step one, the thing you want to think about right away is gonna be atrial fibrillation, okay? Especially with this erratic baseline, no real clear P waves here, right? You have kind of a little bit of everything going on here. And so for those reasons, I would say that this patient probably has AFib. They certainly have risk factors. Cocaine use, right, sympathetic stimulation. Alcohol use is also associated with AFib, as we talked about. Now the question is, what's related to the heart rate observed in this patient? Now remember that what we're seeing here on this EKG, the heart rate, is a reflection of what's happening primarily in the ventricles. Okay, so the heart rate is determined again by what's happening in the ventricles. So remember, I have my left atrium. Let's say this is my left atrium my right atrium, and then here I have my AV node, somewhere in the right atrium. And these signals that are being generated by these ectopic foci, they have to stimulate the AV node to generate a signal down to the ventricles. But not all of them can get through. Remember, there's 500 you know, per minute coming out of here, but we really only get you know, 100 to 175 down to the ventricles. For that reason, because like we said, not all of the signals will get through, there's gonna be an intermittent conduction through the AV node. We're intermittently refractory in the AV node. We're not completely conducting every signal. We're not incompletely conducting every signal. We're kind of in the middle. We're conducting some of the signals, okay, through the AV node. So intermittent conduction through the AV node is primarily responsible for the signal that gets to the ventricles, which is gonna be responsible for this QRS, which is responsible for the heart rate. Okay, that's the way that we determine the heart rate. If we look at some of these other options here, let's take a look at E, for example. What would be in a situation where we would have negligible conduction through the AV node, okay, as opposed to intermittent? Well, if you had a complete heart block, if I blocked this AV node completely and I said, hey, nothing is gonna get through this AV node, that would be a third degree heart block. Okay, so in third degree heart block, there is no association between the signal in the atria and the signal in the ventricles. I can generate signals down here right, distal to the AV node in the bundle of his and the uh, Purkinje fibers to cause the ventricles to contract. But the signals from the atria in a third degree AV block, they're not getting down into the ventricles. So there's gonna be regular intervals between my P waves, and there's also gonna be regular intervals between my QRSs, but the atria and the ventricles will be completely disassociated. So you might have P waves pretty rapidly like this on an EKG, and then your QRSs might be, you might have one here, and you might have one here, and you might have one here. But the intervals between the QRSs will be the same, and the intervals between the P waves will be the same. But there's gonna be a complete disassociation between the QRSs and the P waves. That would be something that's very classic for a third degree AV block. Here we don't even really see clear P waves to begin with, and we have an irregular interval between the QRS complexes, so this would not be the case, right? You still have some conduction through the AV node, but it's just not enough conduction to get you up to this 500 beats per minute. All right, what would be a situation where we would have complete conduction through the atrioventricular node. Well, this is what we would normally ex expect physiologically, right? So physiologically, the SA node would send a signal down and we would expect pretty much all of those signals from the SA node to get to the AV node, right? The SA node would be conducting at about 60 to 100, right, per minute, okay? And we would expect the heart rate to usually be in that range. And so normally we would expect every signal from the SA node or most signals from the SA node that go to the AV node to eventually get through. So complete conduction would be what we would expect physiologically, but you can see here that we clearly have irregular intervals. This would not be consistent with a physiologic process on this EKG reading here. Now, what about pacing initiation triggered at the AV node? If my heart started pacing from the AV node, in other words, the, the SA node isn't doing the pacing anymore. If the pacing started at the AV node, right, then 
I might have a really low heart rate, for example, okay? So if I had a really low heart rate, we're talking about a situation where maybe the SA node isn't working and the AV node has to take over. And now we're running at 45, maybe to 60 beats per minute. This is what we see with sick sinus syndrome, where we have that junctional escape. We start to see the AV node take over in terms of pacing. But again, not consistent with what we're seeing on this EKG, especially in the setting of these irregular RR intervals. And we're definitely moving at a much higher heart rate, probably well over 100 on this EKG based on what we're seeing. So it doesn't look like we have a significant sinus bradycardia or sick sinus syndrome on this EKG. So the last one on here, accessory pathway bypassing the atrioventricular node. So if we had the AV node here, right, and we send our signal down to the ventricles, the SA node normally would send a signal to the AV node. In our situation, because of the AFib, we have all these signals coming from the left atrium to this AV node. Now, in some people, you can have another pathway. So there can be like a secret pathway here. Think of it that way. This is kind of like your Hogwarts of the heart, right? You have a trap door here that's getting some of these signals to come through and completely bypass the AV node. Okay, so this is very classic for Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which we'll talk about. This is your accessory pathway, or sometimes called the bundle of Kent. This is one of the classic ones. And usually what you'll see on an EKG for this is you'll have your P wave, but then you'll have like this slurring upstroke of your QRS complex. Okay, so you'll see kind of the slurring upstroke, and that's sometimes called the delta wave on an EKG. And that's very classic for this accessory pathway being present. Now, where it gets tricky is if you had a patient that had AFib, right, and you have all of these signals coming in from the left atrium, and they're all bombarding this AV node, if they say, hey, look, we got a trap door over here, you know, what are all these signals going to do? They're going to try and go down this accessory pathway. So they're going to completely bypass the AV node. So what can happen is this can be lethal, right? Because now all of these signals can just run through the accessory pathway, hit the ventricles, and now you're gonna be running at not only 500 beats per minute in the atria, and you could be at you know 250 beats per minute in the ventricles. And you can easily, these patients can easily end up going into ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia or any of these very serious ventricular arrhythmias. But again, in this EKG, we don't have a heart rate of 250, right? If that was the case, right? If these each one of these big boxes are 300, you know, you're, it would be more like this in terms of our QRS complexes, okay? We don't really see that here. We do have this irregular interval, which you can see with AFib, right, and WPW, but we don't have that classic slurring upstroke that I was talking about. And so this answer would probably not be the best answer given the very obvious answer here, comparatively speaking, and that would be answer D.